Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. Jack Grealish, £100 million, Romelu Lukaku, £97.5 million and Jadon Sancho, £73 million. Non-football fans, that means people like me, might not get a hoot about transfer deals and who's up and who's down and which league, but they should care about the money involved. Football is in serious financial crisis with clubs, big and small, on the verge of bankruptcy, arguably, and that affects hundreds of millions of fans as well as communities around the world. So, in a break from our normal diet of politics and international affairs, we're going to talk about the beautiful game. With us here, we have Dan Plumley, a senior lecturer in sports finance at Sheffield Hallam University here in the UK. Hello and welcome, Dan. Hi, Nicholas. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, later on in the programme, we're going to bring in some other voices, political tours regulars who, in their various ways, actually have a part to play in these stories. Just to start with, Dan, though, I want to talk about two transfer stories from this summer. And um, you have to remember that some people listening in will know very little about football. Those stories that I like to focus on to start with are Jack Grealish and Lionel Messi. Who are they and what's significant about what has happened to them this summer? Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll start with, with Lionel Messi. Most people, uh, even non-football fans, will probably be aware of the name. Um, arguably, you know, the greatest player of a, a generation, one of the greatest players of, of all time. And historically has been a, a one-club footballer. He's played his trade at Barcelona, having moved over from Argentina at a very young age. Uh, and I think many believe that he would finish his career at Barcelona. He's been phenomenally successful with that club on the pitch, um, has won a number of uh, club accolades and trophies and personal accolades as well. Uh, and this summer he has uh, made a transfer to Paris Saint-Germain, who are you know, becoming a, a dominant powerhouse in, in the football industry uh, through some of their links and, and ownership structure, which I'm sure we'll get onto. But a transfer that many thought wouldn't happen and, and there is a single reason behind that um, and one is the a couple of single reasons rather one is the financial situation that uh, Barcelona find themselves in and the other is regulations at league level in Spain which we, again we can discuss um, so that's a, a superstar coming towards the end of his career on the pitch and a very significant transfer in football. So, I mean, this is somebody who's as big as Pele. This is somebody, this is almost like a once in a generation person who really, really is an outstanding player. Yet he's left a club I mean, he's worth, you know, he should be worth tens of millions of pounds, but he's basically left without a transfer deal at all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, he's, he's probably one of the, the two biggest footballers on the planet today. You, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo is, is the other that gets mentioned in, in the same comparisons and they are the two elite superstars still in the modern game and yeah as good as some of the greats that you've you've mentioned there and and yeah this is the situation that that he found himself in he he didn't want to leave apparently he was willing to take a 50 percent pay cut which was the maximum he could have taken under the league regulations and still barcelona couldn't afford to keep him because of the restrictions in spain uh, and hence he had he had to move barcelona yeah. had to sell uh, or, and move Lionel Messi on. Okay, let, let's let, let's bank that. Let's put that to one side and just remember that they didn't take any money. They couldn't. They weren't uh, allowed to pay him that restricted salary, which seems seems amazing. Um, and and then Jack Grealish, a hundred a hundred million um, hundred million pounds. That seems excessive and a huge amount of money. What was? How are they able to do that kind of deal? Yeah, I think first and foremost, Manchester City are uh, one of the few clubs again that can probably afford those kind of transfer fees in the current market um, and that's due to a number of things ownership structure comes into it regulations come into it again but they are you know a dominant force in, in world football at the minute so they can afford those kind of transfer fees but a, a very different transfer with with this one and, and a young up-and-coming talent you know investment for the future a lot of years left in his in his playing time very uh you know gaining popularity in in the UK, certainly through his exploits with Aston Villa and then England at the Euros, you know, kind of really people take into Jack Grealish as a person. And, and there's a couple of things then with that transfer fee, and, and we'll talk about this as well, I'm sure, but the English league and English clubs are kind of at the forefront of the market financially. 
And there's often this, this thing that's referred to as almost like an English player tax on transfer fees, which basically, you know, Aston Villa know that Manchester City can afford Jack Grealish. They know that money is almost no obstacle. So therefore, their price of what they would set to sell him uh, probably inflates a little bit because they are one, selling to a domestic rival and two, selling to a club that they know can afford it. So there's a little bit of, you know, market price, supply and demand negotiation mm. tactics going on as well. OK, OK. So that I just wanted to, ch to have those examples at the beginning just to... to think about the, the extremities in a way. And if we were to think about bankers, you know, the idea that somebody was getting paid, I mean, we're talking about for, for Jack Greeley, should be, is, is it 10 million pounds a year over the next five years? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems excessive amounts of money. Yet, yet um, I mean, we'll come on to this whether fans are happy with that. If we were to talk about, about a banker, clearly people wouldn't be happy with that. So that that's the, the, the kind of money that's involved. When did players' fees start to climb? That's my first question. And then I'll ask you about when did uh, clubs' debts, I mean, we need to try and explain the debt situation, but let's, but let's talk about the players' fees to start with. When did they really start to climb? Yeah, I think we can trace that back to the kind of early to mid-1990s. And if we look at, again, there's, there's numerous examples. If we look at the UK and English football, the, uh, the formation of the Premier League was, was really the catalyst there and the broadcasting contracts that were signed with Sky uh, and others that have come into that market over the years. That's where we've seen the real growth in revenue is through broadcasting primarily. And we can track that back to the mid 90s. And, and what we've seen there is if you track the, the figures back, we will see player wages rise in line with those increases in broadcasting contracts and the formation and, and growth of some of these leagues as commercial entities. So I think yeah, we're looking at, you know, what are we now, 25 years or so, nearly 30 years since the Premier League launched. So it is something that's been growing and growing over time. And it's, it's the single biggest cost to a football club. And, and it's an unusual cost in many ways, because not many other businesses, as you say, um, would have their employees as their main cost. And, and that's what happens in football. And in some cases, those costs are exceeding revenue and, and that is an issue for football as a whole, uh, but it's been driven by increases in commercialization, broadcasting rights uh, primarily as well. In, in a way, it makes sense to me that if you've got huge amounts of um, money coming into broadcasting rights, that players should obviously have a share in that. But let's just talk about the amount of debt involved. If we just take that the Premier League is the richest league in Europe by far, it, it's um, far better off than you know Germany's, France, Spain, and if you look at those are the, the the top competitors, Italy's as well. You know the the Premier League is is way better off. But even within the league, what percentage of of um, of clubs uh, turnover has been spent on salaries? So it does vary between clubs within a league. And this, again, will, will lead us on to conversations around where the, where the power is and the dominance, and that's a, another problem. Uh, but if you look at the, the, what we term as the big six clubs in England, uh, certainly you know, into the big four, the Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Chelsea, and then obviously Tottenham and Arsenal as well, their wages to turnover ratio has been hovering around sort of 50 to 60 to 70% um, in recent years. And, and that, that's the most that's the wealthiest clubs. That's the people at the very top end. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But the rest of the league, some of those figures can go up into the 80s and 85 percent. And it's it's those clubs that then we start to talk about financial risk factors, because yeah. it's some of those clubs that are most at risk of relegation, which will mean a financial uh, shortfall because the revenue is different if you move between leagues. And it's the clubs that are, are spending large proportions of their turnover on wages that are most at risk, but it's those ones that are also most at risk in a sporting sense as well. So, but the flip side of that is that they have to do that to try and compete. And I think that's what this also comes down to. You, you mentioned the fans earlier and, and what football fans want is they want their team to be as good as they can be on the pitch mm -hmm. and to try and compete with the, the dominant powerhouses that we've got nowadays under the current structures it means that clubs have to spend on players and have to spend on wages. And there is that gamble of, of financial overstretching and, and mismanagement just to try and compete on the pitch. I, I was interested to see, so Aston Villa, when Jack Grealish left Aston Villa, fans were happy in a way to see him move on. They're obviously reluctant to lose a, a fantastic player, but happy because the, the club was getting the money for it and, and sort of re realised accepting that that was part of the game. 
Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at what Villa then went out and did in particular, they went out and bought two or three new players. So they've already spent that money um, that, that's coming in. OK, it comes in in instalments over a number of years. It, it's not as simple nowadays as the 100 million wouldn't have gone straight into Aston Villa's bank account. Uh, mm -hmm. But they know that that money's coming and they use that transfer fee of Jack Grealish to then strengthen their squad. Uh, but that's two or three players rather. So you've lost one but gained two or three others. And, and some fans will, will be OK with that, as you say. But, but there will be others that will say, well, we absolutely shouldn't be selling our best players at any cost. And, but we have to realise that, that a lot of these clubs, particularly outside of the elite, are working on, you know, Big numbers, yes, big revenues, but also big costs and fairly thin margins. And, and we have to factor that in. Yeah. OK, well, this is where we get more into the to the finance of things. Um, just just let's just start with an example of where things go wrong. Can you talk about Berry FC? What, who, who was Berry? Um, what, what, what's their story and how did it go wrong? Yeah, so Berry FC are a, a football club, a, a very old traditional English football club that have been, a, you know, we're a founding member of the Football League back in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, they played their trade a lot further down the professional league system. They've never been kind of right to the top of the game that we're talking about. Um, so they're, they're, they were part of the English Football League, which has three tiers, which sits below the Premier League. Uh, and they, a couple of years ago, they went out of business and, and ceased to exist as a football club. Um, They've since reformed as, as another club and have started at the bottom of the league system, but the Berry FC are no more. And, and that was a tale of poor financial management. It was still a case of overspending on players in the first instance, but the finances and the revenue on offer in League Two and, and League One of English football are nowhere near the levels of the Premier League. But they were spending very big money on, on players at that level. And the other issue with Berry FC was... The ownership situation. Um, they the, the owner that came in who was you know had had problems with other businesses, had seen other businesses liquidated, was red flags all over the place on company documents. Was known to be a, a an asset stripper as well. He was able to purchase the club for one pound, um, but there was seven or eight million pounds of debt that was attached to that club that he also took on, and it was never sustainable for him to. Be able to manage that effectively and and he didn't he didn't really understand football and the club just went on a downward spiral and were ultimately wound up by the football league uh who took that decision out of Barry's hands so the, the example the point there is that here's an example of a club that failed and your analysis and this is what's being said by i mean they're now uh, companies like uh, deloitte you've got a, a major industry industry looking at football finance um, globally across the world that there are numerous companies, numerous sorry, football football um, uh, teams around the world that really financially shouldn't be viable, yet they continue to exist. And this is this is the sort of the dilemma. And I guess we, we, you could you could say, well, look, if there's a company who cares, they're going bust. Um, but here we were talking about communities, parts of cities' histories. Whether you think of you know Barcelona or you think of you know more more regional clubs. Uh, this is something that matters to, to, to fans locally. And it's trying to work out, I guess we're trying to work out how we've got to this situation and how it continues to exist. Um, from, from the 19, I guess from the 1990s um, until quite recently, you expected rich owners to step in and, and bail and bail um, teams out. Is that, is that still the case or has that changed? It, it's still the case. Clubs are still reliant on owners. The... Uh... <laughs> The nature of that has changed somewhat, and, and you touched upon earlier about the international audience that some of the bigger clubs now have. So there's a couple of, of, of key kind of catalysts within that. Football clubs have always been owned historically by um, traditionally maybe local people. It's been a family thing and the, the club has been passed on. They've always been they've always needed owners to support them. The, the numbers have just changed considerably. And what we saw with with the Premier League clubs in particular is when the broadcasting revenue started to rise and clubs were becoming richer, but then the offset of that was that the costs were increasing because player transfer fees were higher and wages needed to be sustained. Clubs were looking for other investors. And there was a couple of big moves in the market in the early 2000s. So Roman Abramovich purchasing Chelsea in 2003 was, was one of the biggest at the time. 
Um, and he was basically a, a billionaire that almost had money to burn. And it, it wasn't really anything about wanting to be involved with, he, he was looking at numerous clubs at the time and settled on Chelsea, but that was almost a case of, he's just got money spare and wants to have a bit of a play thing, wants to be the person that owns the football club, wants to be on the trophy parades and, and wants to have a good time. And, and that's one form of it. But then you've got other things like the, the Glazer takeover of Manchester United, which was a very different kind of profit maximising move. And American sports are very different to, to European sports. So you have these ownership dynamics that have changed over time and they've become more global, you know, and, and other investors now looking at getting involved. We've got private equity firms, you know, the, Mm. Big, not the traditional banks that are lending money to football clubs. It's it's external parties and, and external investment. But the nature of of how clubs are owned and, and run and invested ha has changed. But the basic premise remains that clubs are reliant. Most cases, most clubs are reliant on their ownership structure. And if you then drop down the levels, that's where we see some of the same issues manifesting themselves because some of those clubs are still owned by the local businessmen, the local family, and they can't, they can't sustain that finance to operate and to, to push the club forward. Mm -hmm. So from the community point of view, as you mentioned, that's really important because a lot of the fans of clubs further down league systems are quite proud of the fact that their club is owned locally and it's always been in the community and it's embedded. But to really, sh if, if that club has aspirations to go further up the league system, they need some form of external finance. And that's where you get the kind of the issues and the, and the controversies between fans and clubs, because up to a certain level, you, you can sustain a football club and, and run it in a, in a financially prudent way. And you can have local communities and business people on board. But if you want to kick on to the next level, you need external investment and clubs have looked overseas to that in in recent years and, that, and that's that's in a nub isn't it how do you sustain that community-based idea that sense of identity that's something that clubs in you know carry with them inherently and have a a, a club that compete at an international level um and, absolutely but, and, yeah. and that's a question of it's a question of the club as well and the strategic direction so i've had you know have been involved with conversations at, at club level with clubs lower down the leagues and, and somebody like some of the viewers might not know the, this club but Exeter City who play in the fourth tier of English football they are supporter owned and and they make it there's a lot of positive vibes around that club and the way it's run but their owners and the club itself come out and say regularly look under this model we probably won't go any higher than tier three of the football league because to get to tier two, which is the championship, and then into the Premier League, day mm -hmm. day you dream that far, you need external financing, and and that's with where the ownership kind of collides a little bit, and and the social aspect of football, because it is very dependent on individual clubs and where they see themselves in the league pyramid, and also where they aspire to get to. Okay, I want to bring in in a second some voices um, from, from among our own sort of followers. Um, we've got Sandip Jabamputra, who's an interest in both Manchester United uh, and um, FCUM, the the uh, new club or alternative to, that came out in reaction to the ownership of uh, Manchester United when the, the Glazer brothers um, brought it out. Uh, and also Dylan Thwaites, who's got a, um, a long history of involvement and support for Leeds as well. Um, I, I'm, I, think, I think what I might do, I'll just come to them in just a second, but I want to... Um, uh, highlight one of the things just just to you know indicate how how complicated this is getting can you talk about what's happened in la liga so that's the spanish league and the huge amount of debt at the massive debt deal that has just been done in spain essentially to enable clubs that have got huge amounts of debt to carry on yeah we're looking at the, the cvc private equity investment yeah so again it's similar problems that we're talking about or, or rather uh to try and negate some of these issues. Obviously the pandemic's had an impact and we know that revenues have been hit across the board for clubs and leagues. But even now, not just that the clubs are looking for external sources of financing, some of the leagues themselves are looking for external investors to partner up with. And CVC are a company that have made um, significant strides in sport in recent years. They took away a big profit from a deal with Formula One, having invested and then removed themselves from Formula One. 
They've signed some agreements with uh, Rugby Union for looking at Six Nations, and they've been trying to get into a football league. The, a deal collapsed in Serie A in Italy, mm-hmm. and yeah. now they're in uh, looking at La Liga. And this is to to partner with the league and to to give the club some uh, form of short-term financing and, and to partner with the league moving forward. The deal involves 50 years' worth of audio-visual broadcasting rights, um, which is a phenomenal clause to put in a contract um, in any case. But, but if you look at then what's happening with the power dynamic, La Liga, as, as the league organisation, are saying, yes, please, please come on board. This will be great for the yeah. clubs. We'll work with you. And some of the clubs, and it's no surprise to see the, the bigger, more dominant clubs, are uh, really in opposition to it and have come out and said, we absolutely don't want to partner with this. We don't want to give away our audio-visual rights for whatever it is for 50 years. There, there is a better way, and this is not a good deal. And and that's another problem with football in general at the minute from a governance level, is, is the power dynamics between leagues, external investors, and the clubs themselves. Yeah, and you can see with that, the power moving away from the clubs to whether it's corporate interests, I mean, you can see the idea of broadcasters having the major influence or maybe even control over clubs, ultimately, financially. Well, well yeah, and, and the clubs don't like that. And, and again, we can go back to the, I mean, I'm sure viewers will be aware of the, the European Super League idea that was, you know, on the table in April for 48 hours. And, and then the, the kickoff was crazy <laughs> about that. And then it was it was shelved. But Barcelona, Real Madrid and Juventus are still really vocal in that that is the next step for football so they want to uh, create us all as some american style like like um uh football um american football in the states where you have fixed leagues fixed teams that are permanently within that league and they make all them they make all the money and absolutely so so we're back to the same problem is who does who does that benefit it, it benefits them first and foremost and you know yeah. clubs will always look to vote and and to drive their own uh interest rather than looking at the collective okay. of, of all the clubs OK, well, listen, I want to get some some other perspectives here as well. So Sandip Jovan Putra is with us. Sandip, can you just talk about F- FC United? But I know, also know you've got a, you've got other comments and also possibly other questions for Dan as well. You you weren't happy when the Glazer brothers took over Manchester United and, and you were part of that movement of people who, who moved away a bit. Um, yes. So I, um, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of Manchester United, but I'm also... Uh, a member, as are my kids, of the protest club FC United of, of Manchester, which is a fan-owned club. Um, I would like to see more fan ownership and more fan involvement in football. I think the German model is a is a good model. Um, and one thing I hope to see is that we see legislation in place that would allow fans to buy shares in the club at a fair price. Um, and I think if that happened, then you would see in a lot of these post-industrial areas, uh, you would see political movements to, to buy up shares in the club. Um, and uh, I think it would, it, would, it would lead to greater involvement from the community within the club, with the clubs, and um, uh, would allow, um, the um, the astonishing money that these clubs generate to also be ploughed back to a certain extent into the community. Sandy, just explain how the German how the Bundesliga works in terms of club ownership. Well, in Germany, a majority stake in the club has to be owned by the fans. That's a rule of the German uh, Football Association, and they have extremely successful football clubs, uh, and they have extremely successful national team. So, uh, you know, nobody can, no, no corporation, however powerful, can, can go and buy Bayern Munich. It's simply not possible. And um, they, they've got more financial stability in Germany. Uh, and also, because these things are seen as a collective endeavour, the clubs just aren't on their own. They, mm. do, they are more favourable to, to helping the national team as well. It can, but can you see, Sand, that the, I mean, certainly from the club's perspective, um, uh, if you're in the Premier League, you're in the league that makes the most money. You've got the highest um, uh, sort of broadcast rights revenues coming in. Um, did, can can you have those two things going alongside each other? I don't see why not. But I mean, the you know club like Bayern Munich is an absolute 
world leader. Real Madrid is owned by its fans. Barcelona is owned by its fans. I mean, actually, sport. These, these, all, all of these clubs all started out as, as member-owned sporting clubs. Dan, um, sorry, sorry, go on, go on. Uh, and and you know, I would argue that they were they've been taken away with a, a sleight of hand. Really, I mean, the clubs only became limited companies because they wanted some limited liability when they started owning grounds. And actually, it was a rule of the FA that you couldn't make money out of football. So that was a rule of the FA. Uh, Tottenham Hotspur managed to float on the stock exchange using a holding company, and no one at the FA has satisfactorily explained how did they get around the rule, and it opened the floodgates. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's going going back some time. Dan, is there's currently a, um, a review? The British government is reviewing how the, um, how football finance is working. Can you tell us a bit about that? And and other, would you have questions about Sandip's idea? Do you think that's viable? Does that make sense to you? I, th I think I I can see the, the the benefits of that system. That there's a couple of things I would throw into that, and then I'll come on to the um, the situation in in English football at the minute. The, the the fan ownership thing, I think, is is a. I'm not saying that I, I wouldn't like to see fan ownership of clubs. I can absolutely see the, the merit in that. I think the problem with the current structures and the financial imbalance and the amount of money that's needed now to um, to drive a club forward means that, as I said earlier, I think the fan ownership model. The problem with that is that it has a certain limit in terms of where you can get to in a league, and I think then you would have to ask individual fans about how they view that because some fans might be happy with saying, you know, realistically, we want to own this club. We want a say in the, the shares and the voting rights and we are happy with, you know, never getting above tier three. I think we have to be realistic and say that if the, under the current structures, fan ownership only works up until potentially tier three in English football, but it won't get you any higher because you need X amount of million pounds and, you know what normal fan or even a group of big normal fans can that's the problem with with that the, the german model we have to be careful here as well because it, it's often referred to as being majority fan ownership but it, it's not technically the case it's a the rules relate to voting rights so what it means is that they have fan votes rather than necessarily being fan owned so we're, all the fans of of the clubs in Germany can say if a new owner comes in or a new investor, they can vote it down. So it, it and the club has to listen to that. So there is an element there of that the fans get a say, but it's not necessarily that the fans own the clubs. And again, the, the German clubs changed that system in 1998. So there are still clubs that run in Germany like a pure members club, like your local village cricket club, whereby members elect a committee, the committee runs the club no external owner. There are clubs in Germany that operate like that. Um, Union Berlin are one of those. I think Schalke are another, Nuremberg, some of the names might be familiar or, or might not. The other thing that you can do in Germany, which was changed in 98, was to spin off the first 11 into a separate limited company. And there, an outside investor can buy the limited company outright, but the members must retain 50% of the voting rights. And that's what happened at Borussia Dortmund, Bayern Munich. So we, do, we look at these clubs in Germany and we say, this is a, a great model. And again, I think there are benefits to it, but it's not necessarily that the fans own the club. And actually Bayern Munich have significant investment from Allianz, from Aude. There, are significant, there is significant backing there. And, and the, the caveat to that for me is always, yes, that is a, a model that is feasible. We wouldn't be able to implement it in English football at the flick of a switch because there's too much to undo and you wouldn't be able to do it retrospectively. Um, and the other thing is that we have to remember that Bayern Munich have, have won nine straight Bundesliga titles as well. So for the other clubs in that league, they might be happy with the way their club's being run, but they're not going to win the league. Absolutely zero chance. And it, and it is close to zero chance. So that's important, and I think then to sorry, what, why why can't why haven't they got any chance? I'm, I'm, I missed that. Well, the, the other thing that we've we've not mentioned is the the pan European competitions within the the domestic framework. So yeah. the Champions League, as an example, qualification for the Champions League is minimum fifty million pounds in prize money. If you get to the latter stages of that competition, it can be near enough a hundred million um, prize money. And what we've seen 
across the big five European leagues in recent years. And, and I've been involved in some research where we can prove this with you know, statistical evidence, is that those top four positions where you qualify for those competitions are being dominated by a select number of clubs. And, and Bayern Munich are the standout case in Germany, whereby their pride, their sporting revenue that they get through prize money is far greater than most of the clubs in the league. Their commercial prowess, as, as Sandit was saying, is so great that they are signing commercial deals all over the world and they're one of the biggest clubs. And under the, the financial regulations that are in place in European football at the minute, where you can only spend what you earn and financial fair play is a thing and, and you can't just throw endless pots of money at football clubs anymore, the clubs that have got the money and are continually making the money are better positioned to stay at the top. So it's almost like the regulations in some way are protecting the status quo. And, and I think that's important though. And we have to, we're not just looking at one thing in isolation um, and different leagues operate very differently, mm. but we are seeing dominance in Europe, particularly by a select number of clubs. And then those clubs are going back and dominating their domestic leagues. And the Premier League is, is running the, in a similar way. In the, 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 if you're at the top of the club, if you win championships, you're at the top end of things, you earn more money. The top clubs get, get more access to those rights. Yeah, and, and we can see that in the data. And, it, and it's, it, you know, at that level, it's quite simplistic data because if you look at the number of clubs that qualify for the Champions League and track that back over a number of years, e.g. the clubs that finish in the top four league positions, if you looked at that across all five European leagues, just as a starting point, you would see trends occurring that the same clubs are qualifying year on year. And it's very difficult to break into that established elite. And, and that is a, a, a big problem. The Premier League is more balanced competitively than its counterparts in Europe, yeah, yeah. but it's still in decline since the start of the Premier League. But other leagues have got real issues with big clubs. You know, almost, you know, if, if there's any of the audience that are, uh, you know, betting people and, and, and would like a gamble, you're not going to get long odds on Paris Saint-Germain winning the French League or Bayern Munich winning the German League or Barcelona and Real Madrid being at the top of La Liga. We know it's going to happen. And the question that we're trying to raise through doing some of the research that I'm involved in is, OK, we know that's a problem. So should we not be looking at trying to change things a little bit? Which I think links to your point around what the English uh, government have, are involved in now and this and the fan led review that we might come on to. Right. OK, well, let, let's um, I want to take in um, get Dylan Thwaites now. Dylan is um, closely involved with, um, was a big supporter of, of um, Leeds United and has been a fan for, for some time. Dylan, can you, can you just give us a, a comment, a few comments on what you've been hearing about fan ownership and whether you think um, there is a possibility there to, to, um, to, to make some of those changes at least within the English, English league system? Go ahead, Dylan. Yeah, um, yeah so I'm, I'm a fan of Leeds United um, and... Uh, we, we kind of entered the vocabulary as a as a phrase doing a Leeds. Um, 2001, we were in the semi-finals of the European Champions League um, and flying high, um, and we overspent and went bankrupt twice. Uh, went down a, a division to the Championship, then went down another division to League One. Um, and, and I've only just returned to the, the Premier League uh, after 16 years out of, of the system. We're obviously we were one of the big clubs uh, 20 years ago, um, but it, the term doing a Leeds now is applied. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of other clubs starting to do a Leeds and hopefully we'll kind of lose that to Derby, doing a Derby or doing a Wigan or doing a Chef Wednesday or something. But we, we obviously went through a really bad phase and we'll, once we went bankrupt, we went through a series of, uh, I'll politely to call it rogue owners who, who were uh, variously um, asset stripping or just incompetent. Um, and at that stage, after about 10 years of that, well, well um, it just looked as if we were going nowhere. Um, I, I set up with uh, other Leeds fans um, a an organization, fan organization called uh, Leeds Fans United, um, which was uh, an attempt to get some kind of fan ownership into Leeds, just to get some 
rationality back into into uh, the the ownership of Leeds. Um, so my background as an entrepreneur, and I, I kind of quite quickly realised that there is a problem, and I'm sure that Sandeep had the, the, the same at, uh, at FC United that it, there's a it, it's in a way it's a less of a problem when you're starting a new club, but when you're trying to invest into a, an existing club, you have got a problem that people will only invest if they've got control in a club and that applies to the owners and it applies to the supporters. Uh, and we kind of came to, after, we got good access, uh, particularly to Cellino, um, who was um, a mad Italian owner, who actually probably his heart was in the right place. He was just serially incompetent. Um, he's probably the best of the three owners we had during the, the period. Um, and, and indeed, now we've got good owners, um, uh, which include the San Francisco 49ers, who interestingly, we were talking about the Americanization. Um, they're the standout American owners. They own about, I think they own about 30% of Leeds now, but they're standout in saying that they don't want an Americanized model of football. Uh, they, they want relegation. So um, Dylan, Dylan here's, here's the question, how, how um, I mean, t t touching on that uh, question about the how the way the Germans structure it with that share yeah. ownership is that an option? What if if you're looking for political change, if you're looking for any kind of political changes, what would it be? Right. So um, I agree with Dan that it is the it, the it, it, it's too late for us to go back to a German model. And I was interested in Sandeep's uh, comments about uh, how how Spurs were the first Tottenham Hot Spurs were the first team to kind of break out of, you know, make it a purely finance-led situation. But at the time, with Cellino, Cellino, um, like I said, was madcap. He offered to sell us the club and we'd got a price from him. And we we reckoned that, you know, with Leeds fans back, as we could probably meet the price, which was about £30 million at that time, including the, the not a lot of debt, um, not as much debt as you'd expect. Um, <laughs> Now Leeds United, the, the you know, is probably worth at least 250 million, 300 million pounds. Um, so there's a big difference that we could probably have done something under Cellino at 30 million and started to get enough fan ownership to to actually have control as fans, as Exeter and, and you've, you've said and, um, and another place like Hearts certainly would go, you know, going down that direction. Um, but at 300 million. You're just not going to get that. I mean, we ended up raising, um, and we're still sitting on about half a million pounds of fan money that uh, of people who want. But I, I guess it just seems to me it doesn't seem compatible with the amount of money that's re re required in the in, in this kind of game. You've got to have serious amounts of capital, and and um, I mean, we, we were talking about the amount of money being put up by, um, you know, CVC for the for the Spanish league. I mean, if you're really serious about staying in the game and if you're not on the top flight, that's the kind of money you need. Well, I mean, like I said, Leeds have got a good structure now of ownership and a good management. So the, the, the CEO of Leeds is a, a fellow called Angus Kinnear. And we, we meet with Angus uh, still, you know, because the way things are moving, um, it, you know, we're likely to get all of the things that we wanted six years ago when we started this uh, from the Tracy Crouch review. It looks extremely likely because we came to the conclusion that we we can't take taking a share ownership as a fan if you take two percent or five percent you've got no power at all it depends what power you attach to this so we came up with the idea of what we called heritage shares that had got veto rights over certain things and we had to be very subtle at coming up with things that an owner would allow us to do but at the same time were valuable to the fans and from our understanding of conversations with Angus, that this is where Tracy Crouch's reviews going, certainly in, in, as a general point, is for fans to have veto over things like uh, changing the name of the club, um, moving the location. So, for example, Wimbledon went bust and all of a sudden um, were relocated 80 miles away in Milton Keynes with a new name of MK Dons. But, it, it, you know, that, that, that can happen. Um, when we were talking as fans, we got approached by uh, a, a big company that invests in numerous um, mm. uh, places across Europe, uh, uh, what's called an energy drink company. Um, and it was 
uh, they were interested in investing in Leeds, but would want to change the name of Leeds United to include the name of their brand. Um, you know, which which Dan and Sandy will be kind yeah. of aware of that they've done. Okay. Now, these kind of things are things that most uh, our good owners will be happy to give the power to the fans to do that, and that gives us some basic levels of protection. Okay. It doesn't really stop clubs going okay. bust. I ju- I'm, I'm just going to. I just want to state. You know, I just want to state the obvious. I mean, but we talk for those who are not fans of football. I mean, we're talking about this because this this matters to communities. This is these these clubs are an inherent part of the identity of a city um, or a, of a, a region. And um, you know th- the these the, the how these clubs are controlled obviously matters to to millions and millions of people. So that's just just me stating the obvious there. Dan, I'll come back to you in just a second, but I want to get a quick comment from Sandip. Go ahead, Sandip. Um, can I can I just clarify my proposal? I, I'm I'm not suggesting that we we move to the the German model um, on block. What I'm suggesting is that we that fans are given the right if they organize properly within a proper supporters trust they're given the right but not the obligation they're given the right to buy shares in the club at a fair price and as has been said many fans will say i'm not interested that's fine i'm happy with the current ownership others will say that um you know we will buy a portion of the club we might buy 25 percent, so we can block things other clubs may well say look we want to. We want you know 51% ownership, and we're going to we're going to fundraise and we're going to organise. And I think that's where the excitement comes in. Um, so we're not forcing the situation where everything has to be fan owned. What we're saying is people can invest in their local clubs at a fair price, and they can take ownership of those assets or just take part ownership of those assets. And I just want people to th- just do a thought experiment. Imagine if that legislation was in place, and fans there was a clear legal way that they could raise the money to buy clubs. Can you imagine what would happen in cities like Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle, Leeds, if that mm. opportunity was a realistic opportunity? I suspect you'd see a level of uh, political organisation that those cities have not seen for a very, very long time. And, and, and you it, still think you get they'd have the the the, the finance um, the, the 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 financial club that they obviously value at the moment. Well. I think it would be up to the fans to decide how much they wanted to buy. And it, and it could be a creative. They could say, let's let's buy 1%, let's buy 5%. And they could then uh, buy more. But all, all, I mean, you know, so it would be up to fans how much they want to buy. We have to remember that, that apart from clubs where they're getting a lot of external finance because these things are just um, uh, hobby horses for for countries, they're a way of, of um, whitewashing their political records. All the money that goes to clubs essentially comes from the fans. I mean, it's either coming from ticket sales or it's coming from broadcast rights. Fans are the people who who, who are the ones paying for these clubs. You're right, increasingly debt though as well. So you've got... Um, but you've got to be able to pay banked. off the debt. Yeah, but you've yeah. got to be able to pay off the debt. I mean, you've yeah, got to have yeah. a business that is able to pay off the debt. Now that's the, the dilemma, isn't it? Comes from if, the fans. if you're increasingly indebted, um, you know, where's it all going? Who It might not be the fans uh, who, who own it at all. It might be TV companies, might be, you know, uh, venture capitalists. It's... Uh, you're heading in a very, very different direction. Sure, yeah. sure. I'm, I'm just giving a right to fans yeah. to buy shares if they want to, which yeah. they may not want to. Okay. Um, I, d- I want to come back to Dan to get some thoughts on all of that. Please do um, put some, everybody, everybody else, put some questions in the Q&A box. Um, I know there are other people watching this who've got views, so please do put your questions down or just just to make a comment. Dan, just, j- just some of your thoughts. Yeah, I think, um, I, think some, I, I completely agree with, with the, the notion, as I said, of, of fans being involved where they can be. I think Dylan's point there was, is very important. What If we're not talking fan ownership or even not talking fan shares, if, if we step away from the financial aspects for a minute, but we know that there's that community aspect of this, I think what most fans would often be happy with, and, and I think Dylan's alluding to this, is fan involvement and a little bit more transparency from owners to fans. And whether that's you know, let, let, let's be honest, I know we've been recorded, so we, we won't name names, but, but brutally being honest, clubs don't want fans sitting in on board meetings. They don't want them as part of AGMs. They don't. They want to keep them on board, but they don't want them involved at boardroom level. So but what you can do, as, as Dylan said, and what they've managed to do with, with Leeds there, and there are lots of other examples, is they've managed to secure a voice. And, and that voice has might come with veto rights, as you say, it might come at a financial cost or whatever it is. Uh, but I think a lot of fans would genuinely be happy with with that level of involvement. And again, I think, you know, playing devil's advocate as well, slightly as, as 
Dylan's alluded to with, with Leeds as one of the examples that we always cite in English football. Um, fans are ultimately happy when the club's doing well on the pitch. And I think you could, and we can cite numerous examples where we could have, as we've done, you could have what you perceive to be the worst owner in the world. You could be in X amount of millions in debt. You could have X amount of millions in liabilities. But if you are near the top of the league or you're going for promotion and the, the play inside of things is okay, a lot of fans will just not even worry about that side of things. And it's only sometimes when things go wrong that the fan argument then comes in and, and we start to unpick it. But again, you know, if you were to ask a lot of fans what do they want their football club to do, mm. a lot of them want them to be competitive on the pitch. And at the minute, unfortunately, that means in the first instance, signing new players, which come with sometimes big transfer fees and, and big wages. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a, a broader question, which moves away slightly from the, the fan ownership question. And, and this is um, coming back to the to the I mean, broadcast rights being the main sort of income, a uh, source of income for leagues ac across Europe. <clears throat> what if what if the world were to change its spots? I mean, the, the moment one presumes that Manchester United, Manchester United, you know, Bayern Munich have got an international appeal. Um, it, it all it takes is someone to you know make a big protest about China for Xi Jinping to decide he doesn't want um, you know, a billion Chinese people watching um, Europe, you know, British football or English football. Um, and my point is, um, you know, the presumption here is that these sort of financing models are going to carry on well, for 50 years, as CVC seems to think, Dan. Yeah, and I think we've, we've always had that argument and, and we've often questioned when when will the broadcasting bubble burst and it hasn't yet. We've, we've been through one recession in you know the late 2000s when people were saying, well, that, that football bubble must burst and it didn't. The broadcasting rights went up and up and up. What's interesting, particularly with the top leagues is that, and the Premier League is a good example of this, is that the international rights are now worth more than the domestic rights. So the league has expanded so much that the international market is bigger in the domestic market and and yes there's no guarantee that that will always be the case and um, we we can cite numerous markets where there is um potential for it to to be a little bit for it to fall away we've seen issues with rebates around covid but there are also markets that are untapped relatively speaking and, and india is a big market that clubs are looking at now the middle east is obviously very political but is another big market and I think another thing to tag into that is the, the bigger clubs, again, are in the best position to dominate there. But it's also the players that those clubs sign that can have a different impact that we need to be mindful of. And, and the Ronaldo transfer here is, is important in Manchester United because if it, there was a survey done by the European Club Association on um, younger people, 16 to 24-year-olds and, and some younger and, and in that age bracket. And in India in particular... Nearly a third of fans say that they chose their affiliation to a player, not a club. And that's another thing that we need to consider that is very different to where we were 20 years ago. But there are now people that follow football for the players, not the clubs. And, and Manchester United, in that example, will gain more fans, more market share in different markets, more commercial deals for the next couple of years, purely because they've signed Cristiano Ronaldo and people follow the player, not the club. So there's lots of dynamics within that, but you're absolutely right, Nicholas. There's no guarantee, but what we've seen in the trend is that it's continued to, relatively speaking, to grow and grow. So basically, <laughs> globalisation is here to stay. It's not just about China. You know, there's a, 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 a never-growing um, market you can tap that it hasn't been tapped into yet. Well, that, that's what the clubs are doing and the leagues. They're looking for the next market, the next market, yeah. so that if if one is not delivering or falls yeah. away that they have the next option I'd, I'd love to get a few more questions from from from, um, from, from other people um i'm going to come back to dylan in, in just a second but i can see i'm going to pick on some names as peter glanville i know he's got an opinion about sport he bets on it um and uh also piers reynolds as well please so um pr prime yourselves you two because i've heard you talk about football and other sports um just to get, um, I've got a question from Diane Cook, who's unable to watch today's thing. And this is really about <clears throat> the prices being paid. And this is not so much about finance um, specifically, but uh, why are clubs paying so much for old men, she says. <clears throat> Messi yeah. is said to have taken half a billion, 500 million out of Barca and now moving away to PSG for more cash. 
Yeah. Manchester United is paying squillions for Ronaldo. Surely younger legs are better. I think Mbappe, Sterling at all, are much more interesting for the spectator. Of course, even older men own their clubs and commentate on the matches. Can you ask this for me, please? So I have, there's Diane's question. I don't know if, um, uh, Dan, you've got any thoughts on that before I come back to Dylan. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a relevant point, but I think, you know, Ronaldo and Messi are, are probably the two superstars that we can talk about that even at the age that they are at, they will generate, one, they're still very good players on the pitch and they will make those teams better, but they will generate a significant amount of commercial activity for Manchester United, for PSG, um, and, and that's what those clubs are focusing in on, on those transfers as much as anything. I completely take the point, and this is, we talked about the, the clubs looking for the next market to crack. The clubs are also looking for the next Ronaldo and the next Messi. And, you know, Real Madrid had a failed bid for Mbappe uh, in just the window just gone. They'll be back in for him in January and he will probably move for in excess of £150 million. And, and it's, that is then a superstar that you are signing for the long run. So there's a bit of strategic operations for the clubs there but there's no doubt that Messi and Ronaldo command a huge commercial uh, audience and, and their image is, is what those clubs are signing as much as um, that there'll be a benefit on the pitch for the next couple of years still. Okay okay uh, let, I, I'm gonna I've got some more questions coming in. Um, uh, Dylan just a couple a few more thoughts and I'm, I'm gonna go to Australia and get Yuri Vint but go ahead Dylan. Yeah, just to, just to broaden it out a little bit, Dan, um, talking about grassroots football. So I I own a grassroots, one, well, the biggest grassroots club in Huddersfield. Um, and when we look at our account, we, we pay a net amount to the FA uh, compared to what we receive from them, which is very rare and very little. But we pay £2,000 every year to the FA. And when we're talking about these massive amounts of money in football, that seems really weird that it's the, the grassroots is actually financing the Football Association in the UK. That's a really fair That's comment, the, Dan. The money is all made at the top and really it stays at the top, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Dylan is, has first-hand experience of that. And, and I've played for numerous amateur teams over the years where I've paid to play and you've got your own insurance costs and all that stuff. And it seems crazy. And, and we're right. You know, the Premier League... Some of that money does trickle down. I think the Premier League give a, a, it's £100 million per year to grassroots, but that is obviously caveated with the fact that when you spread that out across the whole country and the network, it's next to nothing. And the, the total amount of, of the broadcasting part or the revenue part, it's a very small percentage. So I think, Dylan, again, for me, it goes back to the, the governance issues that we've got and what we've seen with how the Premier League in this country has grown and established itself as its own commercial juggernaut, the FA now have no control over the Premier League. It self-governs, it self-regulates, <clears> and <throat> they've got very little power to affect that system. And it's almost then they're kind of, you know, if the Premier League say they're giving this amount, then the FA have no power to challenge that. And the grassroots system is, is weaker as a result, for sure. But can, can you see uh, any, I mean, the government's not going to legislate. It's not, I mean, this is a fairly libertarian government anyway. It, it needs it needs real change, and I think we you know we, we mentioned the, the fan led review and, and what Tracy Crouch is leading on. Um, if we are serious about changing the landscape, then we we need to be serious about what we can do. We can do a lot. Yes, the clubs and the leagues will resist, but but there are options on the table. It will take time. It won't just be something that you can flick a switch and everything will change overnight. But there are ways we can make it better. We can redistribute mm -hmm. more of that money all around the pyramid. Obviously, we just talk in England, but this is, you know, across the board. We can, we can shift the financial imbalance and, and you know, not equal the scales completely, but we can make them more equal. But we have to win everybody that has a vested interest in that and people that are leading on that. One, they have to really want to do it. And two, which is the biggest issue, is they have to get the clubs and the leagues on board with that. And the, the, where the power is at the minute, it, it's purely with the, the biggest leagues and the biggest clubs. Yeah, no, it's un unlikely. I'm just going to come to um, Yuri Vint in, in um, a second, and then we've got Hockey Walker. Go ahead, Yuri. Uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, one, uh, I have a vague memory of visiting England at a time when Tony Blair promised or financed a campaign or programme to assist 
fans to buy back into clubs. Uh, is my memory right? And why did it not happen? Um, and my second question is, um, why aren't clubs investing in academies and training their own? Because I think Lionel Messi was brought in as a very young lad um, mm. and look at him now. Um, and I would have thought that would have bypassed the need to uh, pay huge amounts for, um, uh, that, for new That's clients. a perpetual question about, about English football, isn't it? That we um, don't invest enough in our own talent and um, always buying from overseas. I mean, I think we're producing very good players anyway, but that's long, long been the argument that the money hasn't been put into it. Yeah, I think this, let's start with the second one on that one then. I think I absolutely agree with the point. And I think, it, again, it's... It comes back to what we're seeing in, in all the things we spoke about, because on the, the flip side of why don't we invest more in our academies and, and the, the clubs really you know, focusing on that, and some clubs do, we've got other clubs that have scrapped their academies. Um, you know, Huddersfield Town is a, a, lead, a tier two club, as an example of a club that have scrapped their academy. Brentford, who have just been recently promoted to the Premier League, are another example. Doing Brentford's slightly different because they're trying to innovate in different ways, but the Huddersfield example... What, what they actually came out and said was there is no point us trying to sustain the high costs of running an academy when our talent is going to get hoovered up by Manchester City, Manchester United, because the scouts are going all the way around the, the regions and it, they could see what was happening. So their argument is actually, well, it's a high cost to run an academy very well and to a good standard. And actually, we're better off out of that and saving that cost because at some point, a big club is going to come along and take that player anyway. It is pretty shocking in a way. I mean, it's pretty sad. Well, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it, it seems, and I can see Yuri kind of stepping back and, and looking aghast at the fact that they've done that, but that that is the nature of what we're dealing with sometimes, is it, it seems like such a bizarre thing to do. But the clubs have just kind of gone, some of them are just, well, we can't we can't control that and, and we're not going to get anything out of it. So we're looking to do things in a different way. I'm not but, saying that's the right way. But they get paid transfer fees for uh, by external clubs buying their trainees. Um, it's not a one-way uh, ticket. No, but no, but absolutely you know, not. Investment but, but, is not worth it. That's the argument. Yeah, it's it, it's difficult to get into the the legislation behind it in in the session today as well. But there are at different ages, there are different kinds of compensation fees that are set, and there was some, you know, you hear all kinds of stories about you know, like agreements being signed or payments being made to players' parents at a very young age or jobs being offered, you know, to parents and, and ways around that system. So th there are kind of safeguarding principles in mm. place, but there's also scope to kind of push the boundaries on that. And I think, again, it, it's an isolated case, but we've seen a, a couple of other clubs that have gone that way. And, and I completely agree with the notion of a club really wanting to invest in its own and you know, that is a sustainable project, isn't it? I talk a lot about sustainable finance in my job and, and to, to look after your own and to grow things through that academy talent it is absolutely a good method. But a lot of the clubs feel like they're so up against the up against the other clubs and the, the money's so tight and things like that that they just don't see it as a viable option. And I think that's a real shame. Before we wrap up, I just want to say that um, we're, we're talking... Um both with um, Matt Slater, who's a writer for The Athletic, which is a, a very good online portal for following you know, football, if you follow it so seriously and analytically. Sometimes I think sports journalism is an oxymoron. Um, you, know, you, you, you can't find good journalism on sport, but you can there. Um, so we're talking to both him and also to Dan about creating a tour over three days, possibly in the Northwest, possibly in London also, looking at the, the state of football. Um, how it affects local communities, um, how it affects you know the cities, and looking at some of the big clubs and the small clubs. And fortunately, it's something that we can do here in the UK. We don't need to have, um, you know, go through um, uh, lots of uh, into quarantine in order to do it. So it's something that is viable. So that's something you'll get you'll get news on in the next few few weeks or so. But I, in the meantime, I just want to say thank you very much indeed to Dan. Thank you to Sandup. Thank you to Dylan. Do stay online if you can. Um, and it's been a really good um, conversation so far. Thank you very much indeed.